Chapter Thirty of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. This recording by Patty Brugman. Nicholas Nickleby, Chapter Thirty. Festivities are held in honor of Nicholas, who suddenly withdraws himself from the society of Mr. Vincent Crummles and his theatrical companions. Mr. Vincent Crummles was no sooner acquainted with the public announcement which Nicholas had made relative to the probability of his shortly ceasing to be a member of the company than he evinced many tokens of grief and consternation, and, in the extremity of his despair, even held out certain vague promises of a speedy improvement not only in the amount of his regular salary, but also in the contingent emoluments appertaining to his authorship. Finding Nicholas bent upon quitting the society, for he had now determined that, even if no further tidings came from Newman, he would at all hazards ease his mind by repairing to London, and ascertaining the exact position of his sister. Mr. Crummles was fain to content himself by calculating the chances of his coming back again, and taking prompt and energetic measures to make the most of him before he went away. "'Let me see,' said Mr. Crummles, taking off his outlaw's wig, the better to arrive at a cool-headed view of the whole case. "'Let me see. This is Wednesday night. We'll have the posters out first thing in the morning, announcing positively your last appearance for tomorrow. "'But perhaps it may not be my last appearance, you know,' said Nicholas." "'Unless I am summoned away, I should be sorry to inconvenience you by leaving before the end of the week.' "'So much the better,' returned Mr. Crummles. "'We can have positively your last appearance on Thursday, re-engagement for one more night on Friday, and yielding to the wishes of numerous influential patrons who were disappointed in obtaining seats on Saturday. "'That ought to bring three very decent houses.' "'Then I am to make three last appearances, am I?' inquired Nicholas, smiling. "'Yes,' rejoined the manager, scratching his head with an air of some vexation. Three is not enough, and it's very bungling and irregular not to have more. "'But if we can't help it, we can't. "'So there's no use in talking. "'A novelty would be very desirable. "'You couldn't sing a comic song on the pony's back, could you?' "'No,' replied Nicholas. "'I couldn't, indeed.' "'It has drawn money before,' said Mr. Crummles, with a look of disappointment. "'What do you think of a brilliant display of fireworks?' "'That it would be rather expensive,' replied Nicholas dryly. Eight pence would do it,' said Mr. Crummles. "'You, on the top of a pair of steps, with the phenomenon in an attitude, "'farewell on a transparency behind, and nine people at the wings with a squib in each hand,' all the dozen and a half going off at once. It would be very grand. Awful from the front. Quite awful. As Nicholas appeared by no means impressed with the solemnity of the proposed effect, but, on the contrary, received the proposition in the most irreverent manner, and laughed at it very heartily, Mr. Crummles abandoned the project in its birth, and gloomily observed that they must make up the best bill they could with combats and hornpipes and so stick to the legitimate drama. For the purpose of carrying this object into instant execution, the manager at once repaired to a small dressing-room adjacent, where Mrs. Crummles was then occupied in exchanging the habiliments of a melodramatic empress for the ordinary attire of matrons in the nineteenth century, and with the assistance of this lady and the accomplished Mrs. Grudden, who had quite a genius for making out bills, being a great hand at throwing in the notes of admiration, and knowing from long experience exactly where the largest capitals ought to go, he seriously applied himself to the composition of the poster. Hi-ho! sighed Nicholas, as he threw himself back in the prompter's chair, after telegraphing the needful directions to Smike, who had been playing the meagre tailor in the interlude, with one skirt to his coat, and a little pocket-handkerchief with a large hole in it, and a woolen nightcap, and a red nose, and other distinctive marks peculiar to tailors on the stage. Hi-ho! I wish all this were over. Over, Mr. Johnson, repeated a female voice behind him, in a kind of plaintive surprise. 
"'It was an ungallant speech, certainly,' said Nicholas, looking up to see who the speaker was, and recognizing Miss Snevellecki. "'I would not have made it if I had known you had been within hearing. "'What a dear that Mr. Digby is,' said Miss Snevellecki, as the tailor went off in the opposite side, at the end of the piece, with great applause. Smike's theatrical name was Digby. "'I'll tell him presently, for his gratification, that you said so,' returned Nicholas. "'Oh, you naughty thing,' rejoined Miss Snevellecki. "'I don't know, though, that I should much mind his knowing my opinions of him. "'With some other people, indeed, it might be—' "'Here Miss Snevellecki stopped, as though waiting to be questioned. "'But no questioning came, for Nicholas was thinking about more serious matters. "'How kind it is of you,' resumed Miss Snevellecki, after a short silence, "'to sit waiting here for him night after night, night after night, "'no matter how tired you are, and taking so much pains with him, "'and doing it all with as much delight and readiness "'as if you were coining gold by it. "'He well deserves all the kindness I can show him, "'and a great deal more,' said Nicholas. "'He is the most grateful, single-hearted, affectionate creature "'that ever breathed.' "'So odd, too,' remarked Miss Snevellecki, isn't he? "'God help him and those who have made him say so. "'He is indeed,' rejoined Nicholas, shaking his head. "'He is such a devilish close chap,' said Mr. Foiler, "'who had come up a little before and now joined in the conversation. "'Nobody can ever get anything out of him.' "'What should they get out of him?' asked Nicholas, "'turning around with some abruptness. "'Zooks! What a fire-eater you are, Johnson!' "'returned Mr. Foiler, pulling up the heel of his dancing-shoe. Only talking of a natural curiosity of the people here to know what he has been about all his life poor fellow it is pretty plain i should think that he has not the intellect to have been about anything of much importance to them or anybody else said nicholas a eh, rejoined the actor contemplating the effect of his face in the lamp reflector but that involves the whole question you know what question asked nicholas why the who he is and what he is and how you two who are so different came to be such close companions replied mr Folair, delighted with the opportunity of saying something disagreeable that's in everybody's mouth the everybody of the theatre i suppose said nicholas contemptuously in it and out of it too replied the actor why you know lenville says "'I thought I had silenced him effectively,' interrupted Nicholas, reddening. "'Perhaps you have,' rejoined the immovable Mr. Folair. "'If you have, he said this before he was silenced. "'Lenville says that you're a regular stick of an actor, "'and that it's only the mystery about you that has caused you to go down with the people here, "'and that Crummles keeps it up for his own sake. "'Though Lenville says he don't believe there's anything at it at all.' "'except your having got into a scrape "'and ran away from somewhere for doing something or other.' "'Oh,' said Nicholas, forcing a smile. "'That's a part of what he says,' added Mr. Folair. "'I mention it as the friend of both parties, "'and in strict confidence. "'I don't agree with him, you know. "'He says he takes Digby to be more knave than fool. "'And old Fluggers, who does the heavy business, you know.' he says that when he delivered messages at covent garden the season before last there used to be a pickpocket hovering about the coach stand who had exactly the face of digby though as he very properly says digby may not have been the same but only his brother or some near relation oh cried nicholas again yes said mr folair with undisturbed calmness that's what they say i thought i'd tell you because really you ought to know oh here's this blessed phenomenon at last Ugh, you little imposition i should like to quite ready my darling humbug ring up mrs g and let the favourite wake him uttering in a loud voice such of the latter allusions as were complimentary to the unconscious phenomenon and giving the rest in a confidential aside to nicholas mr folair followed the ascent of the curtain with his eyes regarded with a sneer the reception of miss crummles as the maiden, and, falling back a step or two to advance with the better effect, uttered a preliminary howl, and went on, chattering his teeth and brandishing his tin tomahawk, as the Indian savage. So, these are some of the stories they invent about us, and bandy about from mouth to mouth, thought Nicholas. 
if a man would commit an expiable offence against any society, large or small, let him be successful. They will forgive him any crime but that. You surely don't mind what that malicious creature says, Mr. Johnson, observed Miss Snevelecki in her most winning tones. Not I, replied Nicholas. If I were going to remain here, I might think it worth my while to embroil myself. As it is, let them talk till they are hoarse. But here, added Nicholas, as Smike approached, here comes the subject of a person of their good nature. So let he and I say good night together. No, I will not let either of you say anything of the kind, returned Miss Snevelecki. You must come home and see my mamma, who only came to Portsmouth to-day and is dying to behold you. Led, my dear, persuade Mr. Johnson. "'Oh, I'm sure,' returned Miss Ledbrook, with considerable vivaciousness, "'if you can't persuade him.' Miss Ledbrook said no more, but intimated by dexterous playfulness, that if Miss Snivellecki couldn't persuade him, nobody could. "'Mr. and Mrs. Lillivick have taken lodgings in our house and share our sitting-room for the present,' said Miss Snivellecki. "'Won't that induce you?' "'Surely,' returned Nicholas, "'I can require no possible inducement beyond your invitation.' "'Oh, no, I dare say,' rejoined Miss Snivellecki. And Miss Ledrook said, "'Upon my word,' upon which Miss Snivellecki said that Miss Ledrook was a giddy thing, and Miss Ledrook said that Miss Snivellecki should needn't colour up quite so much, and Miss Snivellecki beat Miss Ledrook, and Miss Ledrook beat Miss Snivellecki. "'Come,' said Miss Ledrook, "'it's high time we were there, "'or we shall have poor Mrs. Snevelecky "'thinking that you have run away with her daughter, Mr. Johnson. "'And then we shall have a pretty to-do.' "'Oh, my dear Led,' remonstrated Miss Snevelecky, "'how you do talk.' "'Miss Ledrook made no answer, "'but taking Smike's arm in hers, "'left her friend and Nicholas to follow at their pleasure, "'which it pleased them, "'or rather pleased Nicholas, "'who had no great fancy for a tete-a-tete -tete "'under the circumstances.' to do at once. There were not wanting matters of conversation when they reached the street, for it turned out that Miss Snevelecki had a small basket to carry home, and Miss Ledrook a small bandbox, both containing such minor articles of theatrical costume as the lady performers usually carried to and fro every evening. Nicholas would insist upon carrying the basket, and Miss Snevelecki would insist upon carrying it herself, which gave rise to a struggle in which Nicholas captured the basket and the bandbox likewise. Then Nicholas said that he wondered what could possibly be inside the basket, and attempted to peep in, whereat Miss Snevelecki screamed and declared that if she thought he had seen, she was sure that she should faint away. This declaration was followed by a similar attempt on the bandbox, and similar demonstrations on the part of Miss Ledbrook, and then both ladies vowed that they wouldn't move a step further until Nicholas had promised that he wouldn't offer to peep in again. At last Nicholas pledged himself to betray no further curiosity, and they walked on, both ladies giggling very much and declaring they never had seen such a wicked creature in all their born days, never. Lightening the way with such pleasantry as this, they arrived at the tailor's house in no time, and here they made quite a little party, there being present, besides, Mr. Lillivick and Mrs. Lillivick, not only Miss Snevelecki's mamma, but her papa also, and an uncommonly fine man Miss Snevelecki's papa was, with a hook nose and a white forehead and a curly black hair and high cheekbones and altogether quite a handsome face, only a little pimply as though with drinking. He had a very broad chest had Miss Snevelecki's papa, and he wore a threadbare blue dress coat buttoned with gilt buttons tight across it, and he no sooner saw Nicholas come into the room than he wiped the two forefingers of his right hand in between the two center buttons, and sticking his other arm gracefully akimbo seemed to say, Now here I am, my buck, and what have you got to say to me? Such was, and in such an attitude sat Miss Snevelecki's papa, who had been in a profession ever since he had first played the ten-year-old imps in the Christmas pantomimes, who could sing a little, dance a little, fence a little, act a little, and do everything a little, but not much, who had been sometimes in the ballet and sometimes in the chorus at every theatre in London, 
who was always selected in virtue of his figure to play the military visitors and the speechless nobleman, who always wore a smart dress and came on arm in arm with a smart lady in short petticoats, and always did it too with such an air that people in the pit had been several times known to cry out bravo under the impression that he was somebody. Such was Miss Snevelecki's papa, upon whom some envious persons cast the imputation that he occasionally beat Miss Snevelecki's mamma, who was still a dancer with a neat little figure and some remains of good looks, and who now sat as she danced, being rather too old for the full glare of the footlights, in the background. To these good people Nicholas was presented with much formality. The introduction being completed, Miss Snevelecki's papa, who was scented with rum and water, said that he was delighted to make the acquaintance of a gentleman so highly talented, and furthermore remarked that there hadn't been such a hit made, no, not since the first appearance of his friend Mr. Glavermelly at the Coburg. "'You have seen him, sir,' said Miss Snevelecki's papa. "'No, really, I never did,' replied Nicholas. "'You never saw my friend Glavermelly, sir?' said Miss Snevelecki's papa. "'Then you have never seen acting, sir. "'If he had lived—' "'Oh, he is dead, is he?' interrupted Nicholas. "'He is,' said Mr. Snevelecki. "'But he isn't in Westminster Abbey, more's the shame. "'He was a—' "'Well, no matter. He is gone to that bourne from whence no traveller returns. "'I hope he is appreciated there.' "'So saying, Miss Snevelecki's papa rubbed the tip of his nose "'with a very yellow silk handkerchief, "'and gave the company to understand that these recollections overcame him. "'Well, Mr. Lillivick, said Nicholas, and how are you?' "'Quite well, sir,' replied the collector. "'There is nothing like the married state, sir, depend upon it.' Indeed, said Nicholas, laughing. Nothing like it, sir, replied Mr. Lillywick solemnly. How do you think, whispering the collector, drawing him aside, how do you think she looks tonight? As handsome as ever, replied Nicholas, glancing at the late Miss Peck Tower. Why, there's an air about her, sir, whispered the collector, that I never saw in anybody. Look at her. Now she moves to put the kettle on. There, isn't it fascination, sir? "'You're a lucky man,' said Nicholas. "'Ha, ha, ha,' rejoined the collector. "'No, do you think I am, eh, though?' "'Perhaps I may be. Perhaps I may be. "'I say, I couldn't have done much better if I had been a young man, could I? "'You couldn't have done much better yourself, could you, eh? "'Could you, with such inquiries, and many more such?' "'Mr. Lillywick jerked his elbow into Nicholas's side "'and chuckled till his face became quite purple "'in the attempt to keep down his satisfaction.' By this time the cloth had been laid under the superintendence of all the ladies, upon two tables put together, one being high and narrow, and the other low and broad. There were oysters at the top, sausages at the bottom, a pair of snuffers in the centre, and baked potatoes wherever it was most convenient to put them. Two additional chairs were brought in from the bedroom. Miss Snevelecki sat at the head of the table, and Mr. Lillivick at the foot, and Nicholas had not only the honour of sitting next to Miss Snevelecki, but of having Miss Snevelecki's mamma on his right hand, and Miss Snevelecki's papa over the way. In short, he was the hero of the feast, and when the table was cleared and something warm introduced, Miss Snevelecki's papa got up and proposed his health in a speech containing such affecting allusions to the coming departure that Miss Snevelecki wept and was compelled to retire into the bedroom. "'Hush, don't take any notice of it,' said Miss Ledbrook, peeping in from the bedroom. "'Say, when she comes back, that she exerts herself too much.' Miss Ledbrook eked out at this speech with so many mysterious nods and frowns before she shut the door again that a profound silence came upon all the company, during which Miss Snevelecki's papa looked very big indeed. Several sizes larger than life, at everybody in turn, but particularly at Nicholas, and kept on perpetually emptying his tumbler and filling it again until the ladies returned in a cluster with miss snevelecki among them you needn't alarm yourself a bit mr snevelecki said mrs lillivick she is only a little weak and nervous she has been so ever since this morning oh said mr snevelecki that's all is it 
Oh, yes, that's all. Don't make a fuss about it, cried all the ladies together. Now, this was not exactly the kind of reply suited to Mr. Snevellicci's importance as a man and a father, so he picked out the unfortunate Mrs. Snevellicci and asked her what the devil she meant by talking to him in that way. Dear me, dear me, said Mrs. Snevellicci. Don't call me your dear, ma'am, said Mr. Snevellicci, if you please. Pray, pa, don't, interrupted Miss Snevellicci. Don't what, my child? Talk in that way. Why not, said Mr. Snevellicci. I hope you don't suppose there's anybody here who is to prevent my talking as I like. Nobody wants to, pa, rejoined his daughter. Nobody would if they did want to, said Mr. Snevellicci. I am not ashamed of myself. Snevellicci is my name. I'm to be found in Broadcourt, Bow Street, when I'm in town. If I'm not at home, let any man ask for me at the stage door. Damn, they know me at the stage door, I suppose. Most men have seen my portrait at the cigar shop round the corner. I've been mentioned in the newspapers before now, haven't I? Talk. I'll tell you what, if I found out that any man had been tampering with the affections of my daughter, I wouldn't talk. I'd astonish him without talking. That's my way. So saying, Mr. Snevellicci struck the palm of his left hand three smart blows with his clenched fist, pulled a phantom nose with his right thumb and forefinger, and swallowed another glass full of the draught. That's my way, repeated Mr. Snevellicci. Most public characters have their failings. But the truth is that Mr. Snevellicki was a little addicted to drinking, or, if the whole truth must be told, that he was scarcely ever sober. He knew in his cups three distinct stages of intoxication, the dignified, the quarrelsome, the amorous. When professionally engaged, he never got beyond the dignified. In private circles, he went through all three, passing from one to another, with a rapidity of transition often rather perplexing to those who had not the honour of his acquaintance. Thus Mr. Snevellicki had no sooner swallowed another glassful than he smiled upon all present in happy forgetfulness of having exhibited symptoms of pugnacity and proposed, the ladies, bless their hearts, in a most vivacious manner. "'I love em, said Mr. Snevellicki, looking around the table. "'I love them, every one.' "'Not every one,' reasoned Mr. Lillivick mildly. "'Yes, every one,' repeated Mr. Snevellicki. "'That would include the married ladies, you know,' said Mr. Lillivick. "'I love them, too,' said Mr. Snevellicki. The collector looked into the surrounding faces, with an aspect of grave astonishment, seeming to say, "'This is a nice man,' and appeared a little surprised that Mrs. Lillivick's manner yielded no evidences of horror and indignation." "'One good turn deserves another,' said Mr. Snevellicki. "'I love them, and they love me. "'And if this avowal were not made sufficient disregard "'and defiance of all moral obligations, "'what did Mr. Snevellicki do? "'He winked, winked openly and undisguisedly, "'winked with his right eye upon Henrietta Lillivick. "'The collector fell back in his chair in the intensity of his astonishment if anybody had winked at her as Henrietta Peck Tower, it would have been indecorous in the last degree. But as Mrs. Lillivick, while he thought of it in a cold perspiration and wondered whether it was possible that he could be dreaming, Mr. Snevellicki repeated the wink, and drinking to Mrs. Lillivick in a dumb show, actually blew her a kiss. Mr. Lillivick left his chair, walked straight up to the other end of the table, and fell upon him, literally fell upon him instantaneously. Mr. Lillivick was no light weight, and consequently, when he fell upon Mr. Snevellicki, Mr. Snevellicki fell under the table. Mr. Lillivick followed him, and the ladies screamed. "'What is the matter with the men? Are they mad?' cried Nicholas, diving under the table, dragging up the collector by main force, and thrusting him all doubled up into a chair as if he had been a stuffed figure." "'What do you mean to do? What do you want to do? What is the matter with you?' While well, Nicholas raised up the collector, Smike had performed the same office for Mr. Snevellicki, who now regarded his late adversary in tipsy amazement. "'Look here, sir,' replied Mr. Lillivick, pointing to his astonished wife. "'Here is purity and elegance combined, whose feelings have been outraged, violated, sir.' "'Lor, what nonsense he talks!' 
exclaimed Mrs. Lillyvick in answer to the inquiring look of Nicholas. Nobody has said anything to me. Said Henrietta, cried the collector, didn't I see him? Mr. Lillyvick couldn't bring himself to utter the word, but he counterfeited the motion of the eye. Well, cried Mrs. Lillyvick, do you suppose nobody is ever to look at me? A pretty thing to be married indeed, if that was the law. You didn't mind it? answered the collector. Mind it? repeated Mrs. Lillyvick contemptuously. You ought to go down on your knees and beg everybody's pardon. That you ought. Pardon, my dear, said the dismayed collector. Yes, and mind first, replied Mrs. Lillyvick. Do you suppose I ain't the best judge of what's proper and what's improper? Well, to be sure, cried all the ladies. Do you suppose we shouldn't be the first to speak if there was anything that ought to be taken notice of? Do you suppose they don't know, sir, said Miss Nevelecki's papa, pulling up his collar and muttering something about a punching of heads, and being only withheld by considerations of age? With which Miss Nevelecki's papa looked steadily and sternly at Mr. Lillyvick for some seconds, and then, rising deliberately from his chair, kissed all the ladies all around, beginning with Mrs. Lillyvick. The unhappy collector looked piteously at his wife, as if to see whether there was any one trait of Miss Patauker left in Mrs. Lillyvick, and finding too surely that there was not, begged pardon of all the company with great humility, and sat down such a crestfallen, dispirited, disenchanted man, that despite all his selfishness and dotage, he was quite an object of compassion. Miss Snevelecki's papa, being greatly exalted by the triumphs, and incontestable proof of his popularity with the fair sex, quickly grew convivial, not to say uproarious, volunteering more than one song of no inconsiderable length, and regaling the social circle between whiles with recollections of divers splendid women who had been supposed to entertain a passion for him, several of whom he toasted by name, taking occasion to remark at the same time that if he had been a little more alive to his own interest, he might have been rolling at that moment in his chariot and four. These reminiscences appeared to awaken no very torturing pangs in the breast of Mrs. Snevelecki, who was sufficiently occupied in discanting to Nicholas upon the manifold accomplishments and merits of her daughter. Nor was the young lady herself at all behindhand in displaying her choicest allurements. But these, heightened as they were by the artifices of Miss Ledrook, had no effect whatever in increasing the attentions of Nicholas, who, with the precedent of Miss Squeers, still fresh in his memory, steadily resisted every fascination, and placed so strict a guard upon his behaviour, that when he had taken his leave, the ladies were unanimous in pronouncing him quite a monster of insensibility. Next day the posters appeared in due course, and the public were informed, in all colours of the rainbow, and in letters afflicted with every possible variation of spinal deformity, how that Mr. Johnson would have the honour of making his last appearance that evening, and how that an early application for places was requested in consequence of the extraordinary overflow attendant on his performances. It being a remarkable fact in theatrical history, but one long since established beyond dispute, that it is a hopeless endeavour to attract people to a theatre unless they can first be brought to believe that they will never get into it. Nicholas was somewhat at a loss on entering the theatre at night to account for the unusual perturbation and excitement visible in the countenances of all the company, but he was not long in doubt as to the cause, for before he could make any inquiry respecting it, Mr. Crummles approached, and in an agitated tone of voice, informed him that there was a London manager in the boxes. "'It's the phenomenon. Depend upon it, sir,' said Mr. Crummles, dragging Nicholas to the little hole in the curtain that he might look through at the London manager. I have not the smallest doubt it's the fame of the phenomenon. That's the man. In him the great coat and no shirt collar. She shall have ten pound a week, Johnson. So she shall not appear on the London boards for a farthing less. They shan't engage her either, unless they engage Mrs. Crummles also. Twenty pound a week for the pair or I'll tell you what, I'll throw in myself and the two boys, and they shall have the family for thirty. I can't say fairer than that. 
they must take us all, if none of us will go without the others. That's the way of some London people do, and it always answers. Thirty pound a week. It's too cheap, Johnson. It's dirt cheap. Nicholas replied that it certainly was, and Mr. Vincent Crummles, taking several huge pinches of snuff to compose his feelings, hurried away to tell Mrs. Crummles that he had quite settled the only terms that could be accepted, and had resolved not to abate one single farthing. When everybody was dressed and the curtain went up, the excitement occasioned by the presence of the London manager increased a thousandfold. Everybody happened to know that the London manager had come down specifically to witness his or her performance, and all were in a flutter of anxiety and expectation. Some of those who were not on in the first scene hurried to the wings, and there stretched their necks to have a peep at him. Others stole up into the two little private boxes over the stage doors, and from that position reconnoitred the London manager. Once the London manager was seen to smile. He smiled at the comic countrymen's pretending to catch a blue bottle while Mrs. Crummles was making her greatest effect. "'Very good, my fine fellow,' said Mr. Crummles, shaking his fist at the comic countryman when he came off. "'You leave this company next Saturday night.' In the same way, everybody who was on stage beheld an audience, but one individual. Everybody played to the London manager. When Mr. Lenville, in a sudden burst of passion, called the Emperor a miscreant, and then, biting his glove, said, "'But I must dissemble,' instead of looking gloomily at the boards and... So, waiting for his cue, as is proper in such cases, he kept his eye fixed upon the London manager. When Miss Bravassa sang her song at her lover, who, according to custom, stood ready to shake hands with her between the verses, they looked not at each other, but at the London manager. Mr. Crummles died point-blank at him, and when the two guards came in to take the body off after a very hard death, it was seen to open his eyes and glance at the London manager. At length the London manager was discovered to be asleep, and shortly after that he woke up and went away, whereupon all the company fell foul of the unhappy comic countryman, declaring that his buffoonery was the sole cause. And Mr. Crummles said that he had put up with it long enough, but that he couldn't stand it any longer, and therefore would feel obliged by his looking out for another engagement. All this was the occasion of much amusement to Nicholas, whose only feeling upon the subject was one of sincere satisfaction that the great man went away before he appeared. He went through his part in the last two pieces as briskly as he could, and having been received with unbounded favour and unprecedented applause, so said the bills for the next day, which had been printed an hour or two before, he took Smike's arm and walked home to bed. With the post next morning came a letter from Newman Noggs, very inky, very short, very dirty, very small, and very mysterious, urging Nicholas to return to London instantly, not to lose an instant, to be there at night, if possible. I will, said Nicholas. Heaven knows I have remained here for the best, and sorely against my own will. But even now I have dallied too long. What can have happened? Smike, my good fellow, here, take my purse." Put our things together and pay what little debts we owe. Quick, and we shall be in time for the morning coach. I will only tell them that we are going, and will return to you immediately. So saying, he took his hat, and hurrying away to the lodgings of Mr. Crummles, applied his hand to the knocker with such hearty goodwill that he awakened that gentleman, who was still in bed, and caused Mr. Boof, the pilot, to take his morning's pipe very nearly out of his mouth in the extremity of his surprise. The door being opened, Nicholas ran upstairs without any ceremony, and, bursting into the darkened sitting-room on the one pair front, found that the two Master Crummles had sprung out of the sofa-bed, and were putting on their clothes with great rapidity, under the impression that it was the middle of the night, and the next house was on fire. Before he could undeceive them, Mr. Crummles came down in a flannel gown and nightcap, and to him Nicholas briefly explained— that circumstances had occurred which rendered it necessary for him to repair to London immediately. So good-bye, said Nicholas. Good-bye, good-bye. He was halfway downstairs before Mr. Crummles had sufficiently recovered his surprise to gasp out something about the posters. I can't help it, replied Nicholas. 
Set whatever I may have earned this week against them, or, if that will not repay you, say at once what will. Quick, quick! We'll cry quits about that, returned Crummles. But can't we have one last night more? Not an hour, not a minute, replied Nicholas impatiently. Won't you stop to say something to Mrs. Crummles, asked the manager, following him down to the door. I couldn't stop if it were to prolong my life a score of years, rejoined Nicholas. Here, take my hand, and with it, my hearty thanks. Oh, that I should have been fooling here. Accompanying these words with an impatient stamp upon the ground, he tore himself from the manager's detaining grasp, and darting rapidly down the street, was out of sight in an instant. Dear me, dear me, said Mr. Crummles, looking wistfully toward the point at which he had just disappeared, if he only acted like that. What a deal of money he'd draw. He should have kept upon the circuit. He'd have been very useful to me, but he don't know what's good for him. He is an impetuous youth, young man, are rash, very rash. Mr. Crummles, being in a moralizing mood, might possibly have moralized for some minutes longer if he had not mechanically put his hand towards his waistcoat pocket, where he was accustomed to keeping his snuff. The absence of any pocket at all in the unusual direction suddenly recalled to his recollection the fact that he had no waistcoat on, and this leading him to a contemplation of the extreme scantiness of his attire, he shut the door abruptly and retired upstairs with great precipitation. Smike had made good speed while Nicholas was absent, and with his help everything was soon ready for their departure. They scarcely stopped to take a morsel of breakfast, and in less than half an hour arrived at the coach office, quite out of breath with the haste they had made to reach it in time. There were yet a few minutes to spare, so, having secured the places, Nicholas hurried into a slop seller's hard by, and bought Smike a great coat. It would have been rather large for a substantial yeoman, but the shopman averring, and with considerable truth, that it was a most uncommon fit, Nicholas would have purchased it in his impatience if it had not been twice the size. As they hurried up to the coach, which was now in the open street, and all ready for starting, Nicholas was not a little astonished to find himself suddenly clutched in a close and violent embrace, which nearly took him off his legs, nor was his amazement at all lessened by hearing the voice of Mr. Crummles exclaim, "'It is he, my friend, my friend!' "'Bless my heart!' cried Nicholas, struggling in the manager's arms. "'What are you about?' The manager made no reply, but strained him to his breast again, exclaiming as he did so, "'Farewell, my noble, my lion-hearted boy!' In fact, Mr. Crummles, who could never lose any opportunity for professional display, had turned out for the express purpose of taking a public farewell of Nicholas, and to render it the more imposing he was now, to the young gentleman's most profound annoyance, inflicting upon him a rapid succession of stage embraces, which, as everybody knows, are performed by the embracers laying his or her chin on the shoulder of the object of affection and looking over it. This Mr. Crummles did, in the highest style of melodrama, pouring forth at the same time all of the most dismal forms of farewell he could think of, out of the stock pieces. Nor was this all, for the elder Master Crummles was going through a similar ceremony with Smike, Percy Crummles, with a very little second-hand camelet cloak worn theatrically over his left shoulder, stood by in the attitude of an attendant officer waiting to convey the two victims to the scaffold. The lookers-on laughed very heartily, and as it was as well to put a good face upon the matter, Nicholas laughed too when he had succeeded in disengaging himself, and rescuing the astonished Smike, climbed up to the coach roof after him, and kissed the hand in honour of the absent Mrs. Crummles as they rolled away. End of chapter 30